Y'all yeah. good, Mom? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're ready. This is the first part of a three-part lecture series for Chem 344, in which we're going to take a look at molecular modeling uh, using uh, computational chemistry, uh, where we're going to apply uh, the concepts of molecular modeling to a number of organic molecules and organic systems in preparation for uh, using molecular modeling uh, in partnership with spectroscopy to interpret a lot of the chemical reactions uh, in the course. Uh, this particular lecture is going to look at molecular orbital theory. Uh, it's going to spend some time talking about hybridization. And we're going to take an in-depth look at formal charge and how all of these things can be viewed and understood uh, in the context of molecular modeling. Um, all the calculations I'm going to show you are, are using a program called Gaussian 09 using a, an interface called WebMO, which is a front end that works with Gaussian 09 to perform these calculations. Uh, and unless I know it otherwise, I will be using an E3 lip uh, calculation, which is the type of calculation being done, and a 631 GB basis set. Um, there's more information about that coming in this lecture, uh, as well as uh, in the laboratory manual. Um, you're going to see a lot of uh, pretty images of some nice molecules, and hopefully we'll, we'll use them to understand uh, molecular orbital theory uh, and orbitals in general at a, a slightly deeper level. So, in general, I want to summarize what things can be learned from computational chemistry, uh, specifically uh, regarding uh, organic chemistry. Uh, we are going to spend a lot of time predicting uh, the geometries of molecules. Uh, these predicted geometries are the most important part of all the calculations that we're going to do because all of the properties we're going to get uh, in terms of physical properties or reactivities, relative energies, NMR chemical shifts, IR predictions, all of the stuff we're going to get uh, to help interpret our chemical reactions are based on the geometry itself. And so it's important we get a, a good and accurate geometry for the molecule. So a lot of attention is paid there. Um, once we have that accurate geometry, uh, we're going to use it to visualize the electronic structure of the molecules. Um, and by electronic structure, I mean the molecular and atomic orbitals uh, that make up that molecule. We're going to use the, the relative energies, we're going to use the electronic structures to help uh, predict and explain uh, the regiochemical or stereochemical outcome of a number of reactions in the course. And so you'll see uh, computational chemistry playing a role there. Uh, we're going to spend some time thinking about the stabilizing and destabilizing interactions uh, within a molecule and between molecules. And by this we mean uh, steric uh, interactions, uh, hydrogen bonds, orbital overlaps, all of the concepts that have already been explored in the lecture courses, we're going to see stabilizing and destabilizing these molecules uh, in the laboratory course. We're going to use computational chemistry to predict a spectra of molecules. Um, organic chemists use it to uh, predict a wide variety of spectra. Um, in the 344 course, we're going to care most about infrared uh, spectroscopy, and I'll talk more about that as the lectures continue. We're going to predict NMR spectra, uh, which is useful uh, in this course as well. One of the most interesting bits of computational chemistry that uh, is really isolated to uh, this part of computational chemistry is the ability to model and understand transition states. Uh, these are these incredibly reactive uh, high energy species that exist at the top of a potential energy surface. They have a lifetime of about one molecular vibration, which makes them nearly impossible to study in any other fashion. And so computational chemistry gives us uh, insight into these structures in a way that we wouldn't have uh, in the absence of these tools. And so we'll look at transition states and their relation to uh, reactants, products, and intermediates um, as part of a larger potential energy surface and along a, a chemical pathway for a reaction. So in order to do all this, um, we need a little bit of background understanding, um, and that's what this lecture is designed to provide. Uh, we're going to start by talking about some sigma-type molecular orbitals, um, and I've chosen hydrogen here as our example species. Um, it's the, the simplest molecule to look at. Uh, hydrogen is made of a an overlap between two hydrogen atoms, each contributing a 1s orbital with one electron uh, to form a chemical bond between those two H atoms. Um, the sigma type notation at the, the top indicates that this is a sigma bond, uh, 
which is where the shared electron density is between the two nuclei, which is certainly the case here. Uh, this bond is formed by an overlap of a 1s orbital from each of the hydrogen atoms. Um, if it overlaps effectively, uh, it makes a bonding orbital, uh, which is colored red here. Uh, all of the images coming out of WebMO that are of orbitals that are occupied are red, blue in color. Um, unoccupied orbitals are always yellow, green in color. There are two electrons, uh, one from each hydrogen. They exist in this lower energy orbital, uh, which is why it's the filled in red orbital. Uh, there is a nice overlap uh, of the 1s orbital from the hydrogen on the right with the 1s orbital of the hydrogen on the left to make this stabilizing or lower energy uh, bonding orbital. It's referred to here as the HOMO, which stands for the highest occupied molecular orbital. It's the, the one with the two electrons in it. As this orbital is stabilizing, there's another molecular orbital created that is equally destabilizing. Uh, that's labeled here as the LUMO, or the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. I've also given the label here of a sigma star. Uh, the star refers to its nature as an antibonding orbital. Um, it does not have any electron occupancy. And as you can see, there's no good overlap between the s orbital of the hydrogen on the right and the s orbital of the hydrogen on the left. And instead, there is a separation or a node. So as you move from this low energy orbital, which is stabilizing the molecule, to this higher energy destabilizing orbital, uh, there is an increase in the number of nodes corresponding to an increase in the number of the amount of energy. Uh, important terms, as I've stated, are this uh, 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 bonding orbital being the highest occupied molecular orbital, uh, and the anti-bonding orbital up here being the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. You're going to see these terms of HOMO and LUMO uh, coming up quite a bit in our time in computational uh, chemistry. And specifically, a lot of organic reactions can be understood as interactions between a highest occupied molecular orbital on one molecule um, or one part of a molecule and a LUMO on uh, another part of a molecule or on an adjacent molecule. And so we can think of a lot of organic reactions as, as these donor acceptor interactions where electrons are coming from the HOMO uh, and moving to the, lo the LUMO. Um, so we'll see those uh, orbitals in that context as well. As a reminder, uh, anything in WebMO that's red blue colored is occupied, which corresponds to those two electrons existing in that orbital. Anything that's yellow green is unoccupied. And I want to remind you of what makes these sigma type orbitals. And it has to do with the location of the electron density. Um, the electron density in this bottom orbital is radially symmetric along the bonding axis and exists along the axis between those two nuclei. So this is a sigma bond. Um, the orbital up here does have that same radial symmetry in that the electron density exists around the bonding axis, but it exists outside of that bonding region. And that's how we're going to sort of distinguish bonding type sigma orbitals from the, the anti-bonding ones. Uh, slightly more complicated is the molecule ethane. Um, it still has all sigma type bonds, um, but this introduces some CH sigma bonds. There are six of those, as well as a CC sigma bond. Um, I'm going to focus on the carbon carbon sigma bond in ethane. <clears throat> Each of those atoms is contributing an orbital for uh, overlap to form the sigma bond. Uh, each of those has something that is roughly an sp3 hybridized uh, orbital that overlaps with an sp3 hybridized orbital from the other carbon atom. Uh, it can do so just like with hydrogen in a nice overlap that is a stabilizing lower energy orbital. Uh, that in this case has two electrons in it, has that red-blue coloration, um, and we label it the highest occupied molecular orbital. Note that it is radial, radially symmetric, uh, just like what we saw with the uh, sigma bond formed in the, the hydrogen molecule. Uh, higher in energy than that, we have the, the LUMO, the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. And just like before, 
it's radially symmetric. Uh, all of the electron density is symmetric around the bonding axis. But what we've introduced here, uh, as we go up in energy, uh, when we overlap these two orbitals, is a, a new node in the, the LUMO that isn't present in our lower energy bonding orbital. Uh, each of these sp3 orbitals can either overlap with a, an effective overlap or overlap in a subtractive fashion uh, where the wave functions are subtracted, which leads to this uh, presence of the node. And again, like uh, we saw with the hydrogen molecule, uh, as we go up in energy from the, the HOMO, which has two nodes, we see an additional uh, node placed in, in this mol uh, molecular orbital directly between the two bonded orbitals, uh, two bonded atoms, uh, which results in that higher energy and our notation of that as being a sigma star or anti-bonding type orbital. Uh, the terminology is the same as before, and again, uh, Web and Mo will display these red, blue for occupied and yellow, green for unoccupied. I've only depicted the carbon-carbon bond in this fashion. Uh, it's certainly worth noting that each of these sigma CH bonds can be depicted in a similar fashion, uh, showing both the creation of a good overlapping bonding orbital as well as a, an anti-bonding orbital for each of those six CH bonds. So most of the time in organic chemistry, we're not actually interested in these uh, sigma-type orbitals. We spend most of our time interested in the pi systems and how they interact both chemically um, as well as uh, overlapping with various uh, neighboring uh, substituents in the molecule. Um, and we're going to spend most of our focus on, in this course on these pi-type uh, orbitals. And so I want to talk about the differences between pi and sigma type um, and start with a fairly simple example of ethylene, which has a carbon-carbon pi bond in addition to its carbon-carbon sigma bond. Uh, the sigma bond itself could be analyzed in just the same fashion as with ethane, with some minor differences in the types of orbitals involved. Um, but this slide is going to focus on just the uh, pi bond itself. Just like what we saw with uh, the sigma type orbitals, as we go up in energy from our lower energy orbital to our higher energy one, we increase the number of nodes. And that's due to the fact that in this lower energy orbital, we have a very good overlap between the two orbitals making the pi bond. Uh, we don't have good orbital overlap in that higher energy or pi star type orbital. Um, importantly, there is a nodal plane in each of these orbitals distinguishing them from sigma type bonds where there is no actual electron density along the, the bonding axis. Instead, that bonding axis uh, runs through a nodal plane. All of the electron density in these two orbitals is symmetric about that nodal plane and off of the uh, uh, <coughs> sigma bonding axis uh, that we saw on the previous slide. So we now have two lobes of bonding, one above, colored red, uh, one below, colored blue. Uh, and correspondingly, uh, that same nodal plane exists in the LUMO uh, with the addition of another uh, uh, vertical node. The type of orbitals that are used for these pi bonds are depicted here on the right. These are p orbitals. Uh, one is contributed from each carbon atom. And you can imagine as these two overlap in a productive fashion, they can very easily uh, make this pi bond. That implies that each of the carbon atoms themselves uh, has an sp2 hybridization that would allow it to use a hybrid orbital to bond to each of its hydrogen substituents, as well as the other carbon atoms to make the sigma framework of the molecule, leaving one empty orbital uh, to over one unhybridized p orbital to overlap to make the pi bond. Acetylene is only slightly more complicated. Um, it's very similar to ethylene in that it has a sigma bond connecting the two carbon atoms. It has a pi bond like ethylene connecting the, the two carbon atoms. But acetylene has a, a third bond, which is a second pi bond uh, connecting these two atoms. And we'll take a quick look at both of these pi bonds connecting the two carbons of acetylene. 
In this case, we have a set of degenerate orbitals. Uh, and by degenerate, I mean orbitals that have the same energy. Um, one of the pi bonds uh, is depicted here. A second one is depicted over here. And if you look carefully, you can notice that they are perpendicular to each other in nature, uh, which results in uh, two bonds being able to exist, occupying slightly different uh, 3D spatial uh, regions around the, the two carbon atoms. Uh, this one you can see is sort of uh, up and down on the screen. It's uh, vertical. Uh, this pi bond is coming out at us and going back into the screen. Uh, and they are perpendicular to one another. They both share uh, a nodal plane along the uh, sigma bonding axis. They have the same symmetry. They both come from the same types of p orbitals on each carbon atom. And that's what makes them degenerate or equal in energy. There are four pi bonding electrons shared between the two carbon atoms, which is why both of these orbitals are occupied and depicted red-blue. Uh, just as these are perpendicular to each other, the higher energy unoccupied orbitals, the, the LUMOs, are degenerate and unoccupied. I've labeled them both as uh, pi star orbitals here. They each have uh, one extra node following our trend that the increase in energy from the HOMO to the LUMO uh, is followed by an increase in the number of nodes uh, and a, a lesser bonding. So I mentioned that these were degenerate overlaps of orbitals. Um, I wanted to pick down here in the lower right the set of degenerate p orbitals that goes into making our, our two pi bonds. Uh, the first pi bond here on the, the left is formed by an overlap of these two p orbitals, one from each carbon atom. The other pi bond is formed by an overlap of the perpendicular p orbitals to those, uh, which gives us the, the pi bond on the lower right. So two p orbitals from each atom uh, implies that each of these carbon atoms is an sp hybrid using an sp orbital to bond to the adjacent carbon atom as well as to the hydrogen atom to which it is attached. I want to start applying these same concepts to some slightly more complicated systems. Um, the, the first one we're going to look at is the allyl cation, or a C3H5 plus ion. This is a pretty stable and typical uh, ion that gets talked about in introductory organic chemistry. You can see that there are two uh, resonant structures here depicting uh, the delocalization of charge and the delocalization of the pi bond in the allyl cation. It's important to be able to understand this molecule from a resonance perspective, um, that there are two ways we can draw three carbon atoms and five hydrogen atoms uh, sharing uh, one pi bond. We can show a pi bond between the two carbons on the, the left, uh, placing a positive charge on the carbon on the right. Or we can show that pi bond existing between the two carbons on the right and a positive charge on the carbon on the left. This, we've been taught, indicates that there is a shared positive charge between the two terminal carbon atoms and a partially shared uh, bond of two electrons uh, across the entire three carbon atom framework. We can also view this uh, with the molecular orbitals in much the same fashion we did with uh, ethylene uh, and acetylene on the previous slide. And so I have optimized the structure. And this is where I drew the structure in uh, WebML, asked it to get a good geometry from which we can predict uh, what the molecular orbitals look like for a, a, an allyl cation. Note very clearly the symmetry along the center of the molecule. Uh, even though I drew a double bond on the right and a single bond on the left, kind of like we do when we draw resonance structures, uh, the optimization routine noticed that these two bond lengths between carbon 2 and 3 and between carbon 2 and 1 should be exactly the same in the low energy geometry of the allyl cation, and that's exactly what we see here in these bond distances. It's also important to note that all of the carbon atoms uh, have an sp2 hybridization, 
and a trigonal planar type geometry where all of the CH and CC bonds are coplanar. This is a flat molecule. The advantage of that is that the empty p orbital depicted in this resonance structure and the pi bond are then perfectly aligned to allow for good overlap. And we're going to see that when we look at the atomic and molecular orbitals. So each of these carbons I just mentioned is sp2 hybridized and flat in a trigonal planar type geometry. That means there is a p orbital at each of those atoms. And at each atom, that p orbital is aligned in the same direction as the p orbital at each of the other atoms. This allows for really good overlap and a manifold of three molecular orbitals coming from those three atomic p orbitals. The orbital that's red blue down here is the occupied one. There are two electrons in this pi system, uh, two from the pi bond, none from the carbocation. So we have a total of two electrons in this system, all in the lower energy orbital. As we go up in energy, we increase the number of nodes, going from the lowest energy pi 1 orbital to the next highest energy pi 2 orbital, where there is a node running right down the middle, um, to the higher energy yet pi 3 orbital, where there are now two nodes uh, separating each of the carbon atoms. And this general trend is going to hold for all of the pi systems that we're going to study uh, for organic molecules. The lowest energy pi symmetry orbital is going to have complete overlap from one end of the pi system to the other, where there are no nodes separating any of the atoms. And this depicts a, a very good bonding uh, overlap. The highest energy pi symmetry orbital for any pi system is going to have the same uh, characteristics that this one does where each of the carbon atoms essentially is isolated and there's no good bonding overlap between any of the adjacent carbon atoms. Um, we can refer to these by the homo and luo notation or the pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 notation um, that I've been using where we start numbering from the lowest energy orbital and simply add one for each pi orbital moving upward. Uh, this is the highest energy occupied molecular orbital, so we refer to it as the homo. The non-bonding orbital here is the next highest energy. It's the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. And then just higher than that, we use the notation of plumo plus one. The other thing that I think is important to take away from this slide is a, a simple connection between the number of p orbitals used by the atoms involved in the conjugation and the number of molecular orbitals generated. It will always be true that if three p orbitals are overlapping to make a pi system, there will be three pi molecular orbitals generated. And again, uh, in order for this to work, in order for there to be p orbitals, in order for these atoms to overlap, all of them must be sp2 hybridized. Okay, so I'd like to extend the system a little bit further. We just looked at a system with two carbon atoms uh, and a pi bond. We looked at a system with three carbon atoms and a slightly extended conjugated pi system. I'd like to look at 1,3-butadiene next and see a pi system that involves four different uh, atoms. Just like we saw with the ionyl cation, each of these is going to contribute a p orbital to the pi system. And if there are four atoms contributing p orbitals, we should see four pi molecular orbitals generated. And indeed, that is the case. Uh, with our four atoms, we now have four uh, molecular orbitals. There are two electrons in each of our depicted pi bonds, giving us a, a total of four pi electrons, two of which are in pi 1, which is the homo minus 1. It shows complete overlap from one end of the molecule to the other. And like I just mentioned, in all of our pi systems, uh, the lowest energy, most stabilizing, most bonding orbital should have a good overlap from one carbon atom all the way to the other. As we go up in energy, we increase the number of nodes. So we go from zero nodes in the pi system uh, of homo minus one to a single node uh, for the highest occupied molecular orbital, separating uh, the two halves of the molecule, and that's our pi 2 orbital. 
As we go up, up in energy again to the blue level, there are now uh, two nodes, and there are four nodes when we get all the way up to pi 4. Knowing that this is the manifold of molecular orbitals created, knowing that each of these carbon atoms is an sp2 hybrid and planar, um, it's pretty reasonable to depict the atomic hybrid orbitals as a set of p orbitals, uh, one contributing from each of the carbon atoms, um, and depending on how they're overlapped, uh, we can make this manifold of four molecular orbitals. I want to emphasize that resonance structures are useful, and they tell us a lot of good information, uh, but molecular orbitals themselves are more accurate and more realistic ways to depict conjugation um, than these simple uh, Lewis structure type drawings where we show uh, areas of uh, formal negative and formal positive charge and electrons are moved around from one structure to the next. Both of these methods are important and it's important to be able to use both of them uh, to explain chemical phenomena. Uh, but this is certainly a, a more realistic approach um, and that comes in uh, pretty importantly in a few more complicated systems. One of those uh, is benzene. Um, we talk a lot in uh, our lecture courses about the stability of molecules like benzene and we refer to them as aromatic. Uh, the, the real nature of the aromatic stability can be understood by looking at the pi molecular orbitals that are generated. Um, when we had a system of two carbon atoms, each with a p orbital, there was uh, a set of two pi molecular orbitals created. When we had three atoms with uh, p orbitals, there were three pi molecular orbitals. Well, now there are six atomic p orbitals, one at each carbon of the benzene ring, all contributing a p orbital, which results in six molecular pi orbitals created. The difference in this case is that we have a cyclic system so that what was a, a linear set of orbitals is now a cyclic one. Um, and so we see some slight changes in, in their nature. Um, we see that, as depicted by their energies here, that pi 2 and pi 3 are degenerate. They have the, the same energy. Uh, we see the same thing up here at pi 4 and pi 5, that both of those are degenerate. The reason for that is they each have the same number of nodes so pi 3 has one node uh, running between the carbon-carbon bonds on the sides of the molecule there. Pi 2 has a node on each side of the ring running along the CH bonding uh, axis. And so these have each one additional node uh, compared to the pi 1 orbital. Um, and in this case, they are uh, symmetric uh, and equal in energy, so they become degenerate. Um, the same can be said for pi 4 and pi 5, except they each have two nodes that are perpendicular to one another uh, in each of those uh, <coughs> molecular orbital depictions. So pi 2 and pi 3 are degenerate, pi 4 and pi 5 are also degenerate. This uh, system of orbitals, not the fact that it has 4n plus 2 pi electrons, is actually the source of uh, benzene's aromatic stability. And in particular, pi 1 is the important orbital. Uh, and pi 1 is the orbital that all of us sort of have in mind when we think of uh, conjugated pi systems or aromatic pi systems. There's great overlap completely around the ring in this structure, which is why it is such a low energy and stabilizing uh, pi molecular orbital. Certainly worth noting that pi 6 is equally destabilizing, uh, where each of the carbon atoms are essentially isolated, um, but all of these higher energy orbitals are unoccupied and empty. All of these uh, nicely stabilizing orbitals are occupied. And so it's important to have uh, an understanding of the pi system to understand the reactivity uh, and conversely the stability of benzene's uh, aromat aromaticity. Okay, so I want to transition a little bit here from looking at the molecular orbitals of a, a few simple systems to looking at the charge distribution uh, within a molecule. 
Um, and so we're going to use a slightly different uh, set of calculations. Um, but again, I want to look at some sort of foundational and uh, simple concepts. Um, all of the charges that I'm using are going to come from a natural population analysis calculation, uh, which is done using uh, natural bond orbital theory, uh, which was developed here at the University of Wisconsin by Frank Weinhold. Uh, and these types of calculations you're going to do frequently uh, in Chem 344. Um, we're going to use some, some outputs from these types of calculations based on, a, again, a very good geometry to see if we can understand the charge distribution in a few simple molecules. And so we're going to start with water. Um, most of us know that water is a polar solvent, uh, where we know that we have a, a highly electronegative oxygen bound to lesser electronegative hydrogen atoms. And so there's a, an excess of a negative charge on the oxygen uh, and an excess of positive charge on the hydrogen atoms. Um, and Webmo was able to depict this for us by showing a, an arrow to show the dipole moment of the molecule. And here we see that electron uh, motion from the hydrogen to the oxygen, resulting um, in a negative charge buildup on the oxygen and a positive charge on the axis symmetrically between those two OH bonds. We can also depict this using Webmo as an electrostatic potential map, which is a very pretty colored image. Uh, indicating areas of high negative charge in red uh, and low uh, negative charge or high positive charge uh, in blue. Uh, it communicates the same information that the electronegative oxygen has picked up some extra uh, electron density. Or we can depict that by actually looking at the, the charges themselves. Um, it's worth noting that in web and o, uh, negative charges will always be displayed in red um, and positive charges in blue, whether you're looking at uh, the charge of the individual atoms, uh, in this case a plus 0.47 for each hydrogen and a minus 0.3 for the oxygen, or whether you're looking at an electrostatic potential map, uh, that red end is still the negative end and the blue ends are still the positive end. So I think this is pretty simple and straightforward for the, the water molecule. You said negative 0.3. The answer is negative 0.93. So start over on that slide, please. Okay. So go back to the first one. There you are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good catch. Yeah. Uh, we are. There's know. another one I can correct back in there, but this one I couldn't do anything with. Uh, where was the other? Uh, there were only three nodes uh, in the uh, in the model that you were talking about. It was just before benzene, so it was the uh, butadiene. Did I say? You said there were three nodes. You said there were four nodes. There are only three. Oh, I, there are four nodes, but I was talking about pi nodes. Well, you were talking about pi nodes, though. Yeah. There's only three pi nodes. Yeah. Uh, that one's fixable. But, but the water, I couldn't do anything about the charge. So let's yeah. just start there. Okay. Okay. So I want to change gears a little bit and move away from looking at the atomic and molecular orbitals of these molecules um, and look at another sort of simple and fundamental concept uh, that computational chemistry can help us analyze, and that's the charge distribution in some molecules. And we'll start with a, a simple case like water, um, and we'll look at a few ways that we can represent uh, the charge distribution in that molecule. Um, the calculation uh, so that I'm going to be looking at uh, are something referred to as natural population analysis, um, which is part of a natural bond orbitals calculation. Uh, NBO uh, theory was developed here at the University of Wisconsin by Frank Weinhold, um, and we're going to be using it uh, throughout the course in Chem 344 whenever we want to look at any uh, molecular orbitals or we want to look at the charge distribution in a molecule because uh, it provides us this nice natural population analysis. Uh, one of the simplest ways to depict the charge in the molecule uh, is to predict the dipole moment. And in this case, it's uh, depicted by WebMO as a blue arrow overlaid on the uh, framework of the water molecule. You'll notice it shows a movement of electrons uh, from the lower end of the molecule to the upper as it's depicted. And that's caused by a low electronegative uh, set of hydrogen atoms bound to 
a high electronegativity oxygen atom, and so we see a pulling of electrons off the hydrogen atoms towards the oxygen. The net result is a dipole moment uh, moving electron density uh, along the axis that bisects the two OH bonds, uh, leaving a positive end near the hydrogens and a more negative end uh, near the oxygen. And we see a migration of uh, electrons towards that oxygen. This is what gives water its polar character and its uh, utility as a polar solvent. We can also depict this information uh, by looking at an electrostatic potential map where we see a colored gradient uh, going from a, a positive end depicted in blue by the hydrogen atoms to a negative end depicted in red by the oxygen atom. And we can get that same information that oxygen is highly electronegative, the hydrogens must less so, and so there's a, an unequal distribution of uh, electron charge in this molecule. And we can see that in this fashion or looking at the, the dipole. Oftentimes more useful is looking at the NPA charges themselves. Um, and so this depiction of water on the right here shows a large red uh, sphere covering up the oxygen uh, in proportional uh, size to the smaller blue spheres uh, covering up the hydrogen atoms. Um, the numbers are hard to read, so I've depicted them next to the, the image. Um, the oxygen has a charge of negative 0.93. Each hydrogen has a charge of plus 0.47. Um, and the same convention is used by WebMO to display charge in this type of image as in the electrostatic potential map. Uh, the negative charges are displayed in red. Um, the positively charged atoms are displayed in blue. Um, and each of these three images is simply communicating what we already know about the water molecule, um, that the oxygen is highly electronegative, it's pulling electron density towards itself, the hydrogens are less electronegative and losing that electron density uh, through those sigma bonds to the oxygen atom. Um, it's important to note um, that we can rationalize all of these electronegativity values, uh, I mean, charge distributions by electronegativity values, um, and knowing those electronegativities on the Pauling scale is quite helpful. Uh, you'll find in the, the last page of your lab manual, um, Pauling electronegativities for all of the elements, uh, not just oxygen and hydrogen. So I'd like to take a look at some slightly more complicated molecules, and perhaps those that you wouldn't intuitively know the charge distribution of simply by looking at the structure. And so I chose benzonitrile here, which is an organic molecule that has an aromatic ring and a cyano or nitrile substituent attached to it. Um, I did the same sort of analysis that I just did to the, the water molecule. I optimized the structure and predicted the charge using an NBO calculation. In addition to our NBO type analysis, we can also use a more simplistic resonance structure approach uh, to predict the charge distribution in this molecule. Um, the cyano group is electron withdrawing. Uh, it has a pi system that can overlap with the pi system of the aromatic ring. And the highly electronegative nitrogen is actually able to draw electron density off of the ring. Uh, we can draw resonance structures to depict that the most likely locations of electron loss are at the ortho and para carbon atom positions on that ring, and the nitrogen actually has a little extra electron density as a result. Um, if we put that sort of information together, uh, the resonance hybrid picture that we would expect uh, is depicted here with a slightly positive charge on each of the carbon atoms relative to what we'd expect for a charge on an unsubstituted uh, benzene uh, molecule. Uh, we expect uh, that extra electron density to end up on the nitrogen atom. Here's the actual charge distribution uh, for that molecule. We see that the only atom that's labeled positive is the carbon atom bound directly to the nitrogen. It has a charge of plus 0.27. Uh, it is the most positive atom in the molecule. Uh, and that makes some good sense because it's bound directly to the nitrogen atom. And through the sigma framework between the carbon and the nitrogen, the nitrogen will draw electron density off of that carbon atom, 
making it positive. All of the rest of the carbon atoms um, are actually negative in charge. Um, anytime we have a carbon atom bound to hydrogen, we would expect the hydrogen, the lesser electronegative of the two, to bear the, the formal, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, to bear the positive charge. Um, all of the, the carbon atoms will tend to have a negative charge. What is interesting is how this charge relates to our resonance hybrid idea. If the cyano group is really drawing electron density off of that ring, we should expect to see that the positions that are ortho and para to that cyano group have a positive change in charge uh, relative to the other positions. And indeed, that's what we see here. We see that the ortho positions both have charges of negative 0.19, which is more positive than the two meta positions here that have charges of negative 0.23. Uh, and likewise, we see a, an increase in the positive charge nature of the parent position, which has had its charge increase to negative 0.21 uh, relative to these uh, meta positions being at negative 0.23. So we see evidence of an extra positive charge character at those ortho and para positions. But it's certainly worth noting that the carbon charge is still negative at all of those positions. It's just less negative or slightly more positive. It's also worth noting that none of our resonance structures can predict exactly what's happening at the ipso carbon or the carbon to which the nitrile group is directly attached. Um, the electron withdrawing nature of, of that substituent uh, allows it through the sigma bond to withdraw electrons from the ipso carbon, making it uh, actually the, the most positively charged uh, or positively affected uh, carbon atoms of the uh, ring itself. Uh, and so that's something we couldn't predict with the simple resonance structures alone. And I really want to emphasize at the end here that all of these charges in the ring are only really important in their relative charge compared to that of benzene. Uh, using the same type of calculation, the carbons in the uh, ring of benzene have charges of minus 0.24 uh, and so you can see that there is a subtle change of the charge distribution due to that substituent uh, although all of those carbon atoms still bear a negative and thus display a red uh, charge at those positions. So the conclusion here is that resonance structures are pretty useful to predict the charge change, or the relative change in charge upon substitution, they are not effective and do not predict the actual charge of those locations. Um, and they also don't allow us to predict the charge at the ipso carbon. Understanding all of that is important to understanding the reactivity of these types of molecules. And again, the important conclusion is, yes, we can predict how the ortho and para positions are going to change, uh, and that's something we're going to make uh, quite a bit of use of in Chem 344. But we're going to supplement our resonance structures with a more uh, intense analysis using computational chemistry. Okay, so let's take a look at an ion. We, uh, we looked at water a little bit ago, and we worked out that the highly electronegative oxygen atom uh, bears some negative charge. Uh, the hydrogen atoms uh, lost electron density to that oxygen. Well, how about when we draw a structure like hydronium, where we place a formal positive charge on the oxygen atom? And this is a, a great example, uh, because I suspect that the number of times people draw hydronium, uh, they get really used to depicting the positive charge on that oxygen atom and forget one of the most important things that they learned about drawing uh, loose structures and depicting formal charge. Formal charges are strictly for bookkeeping or keeping track of electrons in drawing structures. It turns out that formal charges, um, which are based on valence electron counting, are not actual depicting depictions of real charge within a molecule. 
and in cases like hydronium, can be fairly misleading. Um, if drawing hydronium, you believe that that oxygen atom actually bears a positive charge, it doesn't explain the reactivity of hydronium. Um, it also doesn't fit with our understanding of electronegativity. And so we can investigate this structure uh, computationally and get a more accurate, more reasonable picture of the charge distribution than relying on the formal charge. So optimizing the molecule and running an NPO calculation, the NPA, or natural population analysis charges, are minus 0.82 for the oxygen atom and plus 0.61 for each of the hydrogen atoms. And so they clearly show uh, that there is a negative charge character on the oxygen, even though it has a formal positive charge. This actually makes really good sense for the chemical reactivity of hydronium. Hydronium is the quintessential acid in aqueous solution. It's really good at donating H pluses. If it's good at giving away an H plus to another molecule, it has to possess hydrogen atoms that are bearing a, a partial positive and are able to become uh, fully dissociated H plus ions. Um, and so this sort of a charge distribution makes much better sense with that chemical reactivity. We can also depict that using an electrostatic potential map. And again, we see a red end for negative, uh, blue ends for positive. We can see that in other negatively charged ions as well. Um, here I have tetrafluoroborate, uh, or a BF4 minus ion. Um, in opposite fashion to hydronium, our central ion, central atom of this ion is boron, which bears a negative formal charge when we draw the Lewis structure for a BF4 minus. Optimizing this molecule and running an NBO calculation, we can see that the charge on the, the boron is substantially positive. It's 1.56. This is a very large positive charge on that boron atom. The charge on each of the fluorines is negative at minus 0.64. And this makes really good sense uh, when we think about electronegativities. It doesn't make as much obvious sense when looking at formal charges. Oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Of course, oxygen is going to pull electron density towards itself. Likewise, fluorine has an electronegativity at a Pauling scale of 4. Boron has an electronegativity of about 2.0. Of course, fluorine will be able to pull electron density toward itself, uh, resulting in a negatively charged fluorine atom and a positively charged uh, boron atom. And like with hydronium, uh, this helps explain the reactivity of BF4 minus, which can be a fluoride source or an F minus donor. And the most important thing to take away from this slide is this final conclusion statement over here that formal charges are really, really not real charges. And if you use them to try to explain chemical reactivity, it can lead to all kinds of problems. Uh, because they, they don't represent the real charge distribution in the molecule, which is based more upon electronegativity uh, than any sort of valence electron count uh, or the origin of formal charges. So remember that these formal charges are simply for bookkeeping and keeping track of electrons. They are not necessarily for predicting real charge. So this may seem kind of esoteric, and maybe it's not that important, uh, that we need to know that formal charge is wrong and we know what the real charge in the molecule is, is like for hydronium or tetraboro, uh, tetrafluoroborate. But I would argue it's very, very important for understanding some key reactions that are part of Chem 344, uh, one of which I have depicted here, um, a reaction between nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Uh, this is a reaction that's a key part of uh, an EAS reaction, an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction um, that we do during the course. Uh, we use this uh, as a reaction to generate an NO2 plus cation, which we use as an electrophile. Um, the entire uh, reaction we do with the NO2 plus is based on our ability to react these two acids together to produce it. 
So the, the overall reaction here involves a nitric acid molecule, which I've depicted here as a summation of its two most important resonance forms. Um, we have one where there's a double bond to the oxygen on the bottom, and one where there's a double bond to the oxygen on the left. And correspondingly, we have a negative formal charge on the oxygen on the bottom, or oxygen on the left, uh, so we have the correct electron count. I'm showing one of the OH bonds depicted on the sulfuric acid. It is our stronger acid, and we can tell that by using a pKa table. Um, the sulfuric acid is actually able to protonate the strong acid in nitric acid. So this is sort of a strange case where we have one strong acid protonating another strong acid. Uh, we can draw an electron uh, pushing arrow mechanism to show this protonation. One of the oxygen atom lone pairs on the OH uh, portion of nitric acid acquires an H plus from sulfuric acid, resulting in this protonated nitric acid. It's this species that, when it decomposes, generates the NO2 plus cation by loss of water. The big question here, I have highlighted in blue at the top is in order for NO2 to be produced, this NO2 plus cation that's required for the EIS reaction, it requires that the oxygen with its lone pair uh, on the OH atom be the lone pair that's protonated to make a good water leaving group. And I would ask, why is that oxygen atom favored to pick up the hydrogen? And why not one of these other oxygen? I mean, it certainly is convenient that it makes a, a water leaving group, but what's the driving force between this oxygen atom and its lone pairs picking up that hydrogen and not one of these other oxygens? And the reason I find this confusing is if we believe formal charge, this oxygen's got a negative formal charge in this resonance structure and no formal charge in there, so it should have about half a negative charge. This oxygen atom has a negative uh, formal charge in that resonance depiction and no charge in this one. So it should have about a half a negative charge if we believe that formal charge. But this oxygen atom bears no charge at all in either resonance structure. So it doesn't seem like it has a reason to pick up an H+. Well, this can easily be dealt with by optimizing the structure of nitric acid, which I've done here, and then doing an NBO calculation to do that natural, popu natural population analysis to estimate the charge of this molecule, and I've done that here. And it becomes pretty apparent that the two oxygen atoms that don't have a hydrogen already attached to them are not nearly as negative as the oxygen atom that already has the hydrogen attached. The reason for that is that the oxygen atom is able to draw electron density off of the much lower electronegative negative hydrogen atom, which is not available to these two oxygen atoms, resulting in a, a bigger negative charge at minus 0.55 for the oxygen that already has the H attached. It's the most negative and most able to pick up an H plus from sulfuric acid, uh, which allows this reaction to work. Um, and these NBO charges uh, from a natural population analysis do a much, much better job of predicting the actual reactivity um, than by looking at formal charge alone. As a final example of why formal charge is important, and to make my case a little bit further, I want to look at another EAS reaction. This is actually the key step of a friedel crafts acylation reaction. And it's the step in which the electrophile attaches itself to the aromatic pi system, where one of the carbon atoms of the aromatic ring goes from an sp2 hybridized carbon atom to an sp3 hybridized carbon atom and forms a new carbon-carbon bond from one of those atoms to the carbon of the acylium cation. Well, we know this reaction works, and this is exactly the mechanism by which this reaction proceeds. But an important question to ask is, if this oxygen is really positive, if it's the positive part of the acylium ion, then why do the electrons go 
to the carbon atom. Electrons are negative. They should be more attached and attracted to and more likely to attach to a positive location in that molecule. And you probably know the answer already at this point, but the formal charge is not going to depict this charge distribution well. Um, if we optimize the structure of a psyllium and we do a, a charge estimation using NBO calculation, we find out that the oxygen atom is in fact negatively charged with about a minus 0.2 charge. The formal positive charge doesn't reflect anything in terms of the real charge. The positive charge in this molecule is really set up on the central carbon atom, which has almost a full positive charge, and it is the atom that is most able to accept, accept electrons from the aromatic ring. It is the most electrophilic uh, atom uh, in this molecule. It's actually worth noting uh, that the methyl carbon with its three uh, bonds to H atoms is actually the most negative atom uh, in this molecule. And that's certainly something we wouldn't uh, predict by looking at formal charge alone. This big positive real charge on that carbon atom allows it to react as an electrophile with the aromatic pi system and form that new carbon-carbon bond. And again, um, the NBO charges actually reflect reactivity and allow us to uh, <coughs> effectively predict uh, the reactivity of the acyllium cation in a way that we really couldn't with that formal charge alone. That's the end of the problem. Should be fine. <laughs>